take our Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. There are some people who, uh, who believe that the gospel morphed, that it changed from the gospel of Jesus to the gospel of Paul. And uh, from the gospel of the kingdom to the gospel of grace. And a lot of that thinking has permeated uh, the current popular message or gospel of, of evangelical churches. But I have thoroughly studied the writings of Paul and the book of Acts. And I have to tell you that Paul loved the kingdom and included it. Um, in fact, just, let's just skip back to Acts, the last chapter in the book of Acts, the last few verses of the last chapter of Acts. Acts 28, verse 23. Paul is at the end of his life, it's just before he was martyred. He's under house arrest. Uh, members of the Praetorian Guard, the Roman soldiers, are guarding him every day. Verse 23, chapter 28, verse 23, it says, When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodgings in greater numbers. These are seekers, people who want to hear the message. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Now you have to remember they didn't have the New Testament at that time. So he's using the Old Testament to lay the foundation for the message. But did you get that? What, what, he, what was he teaching at the end of his life? The kingdom of God. All right, look at the last verse in, the uh, last two verses in the book of Acts. He lived there two whole years, this is Paul, at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So that's how the book of Acts ends. I don't know how anybody who isn't blind and deaf could say that Paul didn't, didn't understand the kingdom, didn't see the kingdom, didn't preach the kingdom. The scripture says that was his theme, that was his message. But look at 1 Corinthians 15 now. Um, we're beginning with verse 24. Then comes the end when he, Jesus, delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Now when I read that, um, I personalize it. In other words, that is what Jesus has done in me. He has put the enemy in me under his feet through salvation. Because that's what he's doing. In other words, why did he go to the cross? To destroy the power of sin, the power of the devil, the power of death, but to restore the rule of God. And he's putting down the enemies of God. He's destroying them, one after another. And this enemy within me has surrendered. I hope the enemy within you has. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under Jesus' feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it's plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. In other words, God the Father is not in subjection to Jesus. There's still a hierarchy in the Godhead. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit still operate in a trinity, in a, a cycle of love relationships, but there are roles in the trinity, and the Father is the head of the Godhead. That has not changed, even though Jesus has been given all authority in heaven and earth. 
But when it says all things are put in subjection, it's plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all, when all things are subjected to him, the Father, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. So Paul's grasp of what's going on at this time in history is just this. God in Jesus has initiated a divine takeover. The surprising thing is how he did it. I mean, we think in terms of weapons of mass destruction and, and you know, power that cannot be resisted, irresistible power. And God could do that. He could just simply terrorize us to the point where we would all give up. But what he did was come in love, in grace, in humility, in the person of Jesus, and die in our place to demonstrate who he was. He is not this, this ruler who takes his power and, you know, and crushes everything under him. He's, uh, he's a nurturer. He's a shepherd. He is a good God. He is righteous. He is not unrighteous in seeking power and control. Um, otherwise, he'd, just, he'd be just like us. If God was a control freak, if God was self-centered, he wouldn't have any basis for condemning us for the same thing. He's not. God is others focused. He lives in this trinity where the Father gives himself away to the Son and the Spirit, the, the Son gives himself away to the Father and the Spirit, the Spirit gives himself away to the Son and the Father. They are a perpetual cycle of love. They are the original microcosm of true community, or macrocosm. Um, and that's why we understand relationship. That's why we know what love is, because that's who God is. That's why we appreciate and enjoy camaraderie and friendship, fellowship. That's why it's so good when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. It's because we're operating out of the design of God himself. We'll do it. But having uh, read this, I, I just wanted to make sure you understand that this is not just something I'm taking out of the words of Jesus. This is the message of the New Testament. So let's, uh, let's take it a little bit further. We started, or we ended with these castles. And uh, I mentioned that what suffers if uh, we have not surrendered to Jesus is that transformation doesn't work. Uh, how many of you have been Christians for at least 20 years? Let me see your hands. Okay, about half of you. If you've been a Christian that long, you know by now that you never make progress without fresh surrender. If you do not yield to the Holy Spirit on a day-by-day, week-by-week basis, if you have some holdout points in your life, you will stop the transformation process. Transformation, or becoming like Jesus, Growing up and becoming mature in Christ, what the old theologians called the sanctification process, it functions on surrender. That's the only way it works. As soon as you say, no, that's mine, can't have that, no, I'm not going there, you've done growing until you surrender. All right? This, uh, this session is just focusing on releasing the government of God in our lives, so what I'm going to do is just simply tell you why I'm so passionate about this in a world that doesn't think quite like this, even though it's a Christian world. The popular gospel, and I use that term not disparagingly, but just simply accurately, what you hear most of the time in most churches from most speakers, uh, I would call a popular gospel. And a popular gospel is powerful because if you don't hear it quite that way, you think something's wrong. Because everybody believes this. So here's the popular gospel. 
They believe that faith is required for salvation. So you meet Jesus. I'm not going to get this thing going again, sorry. You meet Jesus at the cross. Uh, you believe that he died in your place. You believe that you're a sinner. And you ask to be saved. You ask for forgiveness and for the benefits that Jesus has won for you at the cross. So you, there's faith required. But no mention is made of following. Following, therefore, is considered optional. You don't need it for salvation. You don't have to start following Jesus. All you have to do is believe on Jesus. That's the popular gospel. However, it doesn't work. Now, I've termed this now non-following believers. I can't tell you how frustrating it is as a pastor to have hundreds of people in your church who do not follow Jesus, but who claim to be Christians. I pray the prayer, I'm born again, I'm going to heaven when I die, Maybe someday I'll follow Jesus. What? What is that? That is a way of using the cross. That's a way of manipulating grace to serve your own purposes. And that's how bad our problem is with needing to be in control. But... Uh, what happens is that it doesn't work. So pastors like Mark and I, all over the evangelical world, the Bible teaching church world, um, we got to figure out a way to, to jumpstart our people. Okay, how do you get non-following believers activated? How do you get people who think they're saved, but who obviously are not following Jesus, how do you get them to follow? So what happens is in different denominations and different groups, there's these different uh, systems that are developed, and, or different emphases. You've got uh, in the uh, Pentecostal and Charismatic traditions, you have the second blessing. What's that about? Okay, you say you're a Christian, you receive Jesus as your Savior, it isn't working, it's not transforming your life, you need the second blessing. All right? So you come to the altar, and you pray, and you ask God for the Holy Spirit, and it does work. Because many people who come for the second blessing are desperate for the control of God. And they're asking for the Holy Spirit to come upon them with power and to take over their lives. And he's happy to do that. So I've heard many testimonies of people who have had the second blessing. What are they talking about? God taking over. Where other, uh, it were before he had not been in charge. The baptism of the Spirit is another way of describing that. Um, in our circles, we probably be more, more comfortable with rededication or reconsecration of our lives. I know, man, when I was growing up in a Bible teaching church, a lot of the youth rallies and the summer camps and so forth. I mean, I, I rededicated my life every chance I got, you know, uh, trying to get, get more of God in my life. Being filled with or controlled by the Spirit, renewal, and then now, all over the world, people are praying desperately for revival. Because obviously something's wrong with even our Christian churches. For the most part, we're powerless. Our, our divorce rate is right up there, generally speaking, with the rest of, of the world. Um, our children are running to excess in drugs and alcohol and sex. Many of our children, in fact, the majority, if the, if the uh, polls and the pollsters are right, the, the statistics show that uh, the majority of people, of kids raised in churches like ours, fall away now. They leave it behind and don't attend church anymore, don't read the Bible, and 
I'll say, I tried that, doesn't work. Glad it works for you, doesn't work for me. This is a very postmodern way of, of talking about it. So there's people all over the world who are praying for revival. What is revival? Have you ever studied your Bible? Do you know what happens when the Spirit of God comes in a fresh way? <clears throat> you know what happens? It's the R word. Repentance. <laughs> Repentance has always historically been the hallmark of revival. Alright? So, what we're trying to do now is get what should have happened here started here. And I think that's a mistake. I think we should, I think we should go back. In fact, let me show you the next diagram. Um, this is why I'm really troubled by that model. For the simple reason that the kingdom of self, where I want my own way, I'm an independent, I'm self-sufficient, I'm in control, coupled with a grace gift received by faith, creates the same thing in supposedly the kingdom of God. I mean, this and this are identical. So when you have churches full of people who want their own way, who are independents, who live a self-life that's in control, you got a very significant problem. It's one of the reasons why churches today are such dangerous places. Why churches are so hard on their pastors, and why pastors are so hard on their people, and why there's so much infighting and splitting and dividing and chaos. What is it? It's this stuff that's been sanctified as normal in the church life. And so what we do is we say, well, yeah, there's been no real change in terms of who's in control. We'll just call these people carnal or backslidden. I'm sorry. That used to work for me. It doesn't work anymore. What I'm saying is I, I don't know if they're Christians. If, if you don't follow Jesus, if you're in control of your own life, if you're a self-centered person and that's okay with you, and you can live that way day after day, week after week, year after year, something didn't connect when you came to Christ. Because what God is after is Christ in control. Jesus didn't just die to save you from your sins. He died, he died for you to take over. He died to retake the ground that you had <coughs> usurped and that I had usurped. And that's when the kingdom of heaven comes, when the kingdom of God comes. So. With the kingdom gospel, what we're saying is this. For those of you who, who like to think, and like to think about these things deeply, and want to have it make sense, leadership and followership needs to be settled at the cross, at the point of salvation. So repentant faith is about bowing and believing. You bow and believe. In other words, you... You acquiesce to God's authority and you say, okay, you can be God. And thank you that it's possible through Jesus for that to happen. So there's humble submission, there's a willingness to follow Christ and be filled with or controlled by the Spirit. And what I'm saying is that it all starts with salvation and that's the event that then leads to a process. Uh, you and I know that we are not capable of repenting at one point in our lives in a way that will carry us all the way through. It's not possible. Repentance is an event followed by a process. You keep on yielding. You keep on surrendering. You keep on letting God be God in your life. It's a way of life. And uh, that's, that's what makes it exciting and wonderful. So, what I'm, what I'm saying is let's win the battle for control here at the cross and then in our discipleship process 
our teaching, our preaching, our Bible studies, our fellowship, our accountability with each other, let's maintain it. So, instead of, for instance, confronting each other over things like sexual sin or addictions, We need to be confronting each other as soon as we feel and smell independent spirit, strong self-will, my way or the highway. I'm in control, and if I can't be in control, I'm out of here. That is the real evil. That is worse than drinking. That is worse than swearing. That is worse than sexual promiscuity. I'm in control here. Don't tell me what to do. Or I'm out of here. If I don't get my way, I'm out of here. That is what, is, has, what has been blighting. It's a disease in our churches. And the fact of the matter is there's churches all around. You can leave. You don't like something, you don't like the preacher, you don't like what the board is doing, you don't like this or that, you don't like the style of worship, you can go find another church. The problem is you've got to take yourself with you. <laughs> and the same is true of pastors. I'm not in any way saying pastors have less of a problem with that than the rest of you. I mean, why do I know so much about rebellion? So I'm a rebel. It's been a lifelong battle with me. I am a strong woman. I married a woman who's strong woman. If, if we didn't live and surrender to Jesus, we'd kill each other. It, I mean, it, it's true. She is the original Iron Maiden. <laughs> You know, in relationships, you play these games. We call them emotional games, but or relational games. But you know, in, in our marriage, it always has felt like we play, we're playing poker, and she is way better at, at bluffing than I am. <laughs> and I mean, I drop out as soon as the price gets too big or the cost is too high, and she raises. Okay. <laughs> and she knows that about me. She knows. She can win if she just pushes the cost up. All right? Apart from Jesus Christ, we would not have a good marriage. Apart from surrender to the Holy Spirit, we would really be hard on each other. We have the most amazing love relationship, but it is totally centered in submission to Christ. As soon as we get out on each other again, we know the first thing that's got to happen is we've got to go back and get right with the Lord. That's where the problem is. And then we come back and make it right with each other. Is this accurate to the way Jesus taught the gospel? I can tell you things, you know, and it doesn't matter. What I think doesn't matter, what Pastor Mark thinks doesn't matter. Unless it's what the scripture says. Unless it's what God has told us and taught us. Jesus taught on salvation in several instances. And I'm, what I'm going to do right now is just take you through a couple of passages where Jesus taught about what salvation is. Because I want to just convince you that this is not my idea. This is rooted in the message of Jesus. So Luke chapter 18 verses 10 through 14 is that passage about the uh, Pharisee and the tax collector. If you just turn there quickly. Um, Luke chapter 18 verses 10 through 14. Let me read it. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One, a Pharisee, and the other, a tax collector. Now, the tax collectors of that day were the bottom feeders. I mean, they were, they were the way down in others. They were the, the uh, collaborators with the Roman government. They were considered scum. They were traitors. Uh, and by and large, they, were, they operated as if they were criminals. 
The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed. And this is the way he prayed. God, I thank you that I am not like other men. Extortionists, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. You can just about hear the way he would say that, this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. The one who humbles himself will be exalted. You say, well, does this really have to do with salvation? Did you catch the fact that this is about justification? Who went down to his house justified before God? The tax collector. So we're talking about justification. We're talking about salvation. So here's the, the, the situation. The kingdom of self here is played out by the Pharisee. He's full of himself, his own superiority, his own sense of his own self-righteousness, his pride. <coughs> the question, who is justified before God, is central to the story. And then the publican, who recognized his sin, confessed his sin, there's no sign of self-justification, and he's obviously operating in humility, he won't even raise his eyes to heaven because of his sense of being in God's presence. Now here's the punchline, the principle, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. There's something about voluntary humility that attracts the grace of God. Please listen to me. I know that there are some of you, I was raised in a reformed tradition, uh, Dutch dairy farmers, everybody went to the Dutch Reformed Church or to uh, the Christian Reformed Church. And it was drilled into me that grace is a mystery. That it just happens. God selects you. God chooses you. And then I start reading the Bible and I find out, wait a second, there's something else involved. When a person humbles themselves, it attracts the grace of God. There's, there is this suction of, that, that humility produces toward God's grace. And God turns the faucet of grace on into lives where people are voluntarily humbling themselves. Remember the, uh, the verse that's repeated over and over in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament? God resists the... Problem. He gives grace to the... Okay, so where's the mystery about grace? He gives grace to the humble. What's the next phrase usually? Humble yourself, therefore, before the mighty hand of God, that He might exalt you in due time. Say, so what does that have to do with salvation? It has everything to do with salvation. It has to do with approaching God as if He was God. Treating him as if he was God. Acting as if you really were a creature instead of God's equal. That's called humility. Let's look at another passage. Uh, this I'm going to not ask you to read, but it's Luke chapter 15. It's the what we call the prodigal son story. And uh, you remember how the young man... Uh, got up on his high horse and said, I'm not going to wait for the old geezer to die. Um, I'm young, I want my money now so I can have fun with it. And he asked his dad the uh, unthinkable in that part of the world at that time, I want my inheritance early. And his dad was agreeable. He said, okay, you want it, you can have it. And he divided his, his land and his possessions with his two sons, and the young man took that, went his way, he had an independent spirit, he wanted his own way, he chose to live life as he pleased, he wanted to be out from under his dad, full of himself, his 
crowd. And then as the story goes, you remember that his wealth disappeared, his friends disappeared. And he's in the pig pen feeding pigs and looking longingly at the pig food. And he suddenly came to his senses. What did I do? He came to his senses. He said, I will go back. I will confess. I will humble myself before my father. And the father's response was he ran to his son, filled with compassion, embraced him, kissed him, celebrated him, welcomed him home. Now, was there a cost involved? Yes. He never got back his inheritance. He got back his father's heart. He got back his father's relationship. But his brother had the farm. No question about that. Repentance doesn't necessarily restore what you've thrown away in your rebellion. Sometimes it does. Uh, by this I mean this. Let's take a different illustration. I can't tell you now how many times I've had people come to me and say, okay, I'm ready to repent. And I ask the question immediately, why? And then I hear the sad story. I lost my business. My marriage is on the rocks. Whatever. I'm ready to come back to God. Okay, okay, what's the deal you want God to do for you? Well, I want him to restore my marriage. Or I want him to restore my business. Okay, so now we're doing a deal with God, right? I'll repent if you come through for me. Uh, God doesn't do those deals. I'm sorry. He may, if you come with a humble heart and lay your life out before him and say, whatever you want to do with the rest of my life, it's okay with me. If you want to restore my dear wife to me or my dear husband, great. If you want to restore my, my wayward child, great. But it's not a precondition. I'm just yours. No strings attached. That would be the way you come back to the Father. And that's what the prodigal son did. He came back, no expectations of getting his inheritance back. So the principle, grace flows to the humble. He humbled himself, came home, confessed, came back, and grace flowed to him. What time are we through? Ten of. Ten of. Ten of. Ten of. Okay. We're getting close. Here's the spectrum of response, and I'll, I'll end with this. By the way, this stuff isn't in the book. Uh, this is some new thoughts. But here's the spectrum that I see of response. Those are that's that's the uh, a spectrum of hearts from a hard, cold heart to a soft warm, responsive heart, all right? The hard heart and the cold heart are the extremes of human response. The one side that the New Testament talks about people who are rich toward themselves. They have a very healthy self-life in the sense that they're full of themselves, all right? Poor in spirit is the place where you come to the realization, I don't know how to run my life. I, every time I try something, it backfires. Every time yeah, I take two steps forward, and then I take three steps backwards. So here you've got, on one side, people who are independent, full, you know, self-sufficient. They're winners. They're full of themselves. They have much to lose. They're close to God. This is why Jesus said, rich people, it's impossible for a rich man to inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's why. I got it together. I made it. I'm successful. What do I need God for? Why would I humble myself when I can control my empire? On the other side, there are those who are broken by life, by their experiences, their contrite, broken-hearted, 
They're bruised, crushed, oppressed, and they tend to be open toward God. Not always. Human pride is such that when you're down and out, you can be just as prideful as if you're up and out. Mad, defensive, blaming everybody for why you're the way you are and where you, and where you are. <coughs> and here's the response of Jesus. The more full of yourself you are, the harder he is on you. And the more humble you are, the more gentle, merciful, and compassionate he is with you. That is true. I have watched that in hundreds and hundreds of lives. The more self-sufficient, full of themselves, I can do it, I can handle it, I can solve my problems, all i got to do is put my head down and work harder, I can work my way out of this situation, I can figure out a solution, Those folks are so hard to the gospel. And some of them claim to be Christians. On the other side, those who are willing to give up and say, Lord, you know how to run my life better than I do. You know how to give me pleasure better than I do. You know how to give me fun better than I know how to have fun. You know how to make me successful better than I know how to be successful. You know how to make my life complete. You know how to make me a, a, a success. You know how, many, how to make me the best me. I'm going to put my life in your hands. I'm going to trust you to be my manager and my life coach. You tell me what to do. And I'm going to stop running my life as if it was my own little company and I was the CEO. Because you are in control of that changes everything. But this response of Jesus, let's just illustrate it and then we'll close. Who, when Jesus was evangelizing the Pharisees, what kind of evangelism did he use? You pit of vipers. You sepulchers full of corruption and rot and dead men's bones. You blind leaders of the blind. What was he doing? He was confronting them with their self-centeredness and their sense of rightness. We're superior. We're better than him. We got it together. And he's just going in like a knife through hot butter. No, you don't have it better. You're really messed up. You just don't know it. Your pride and your ego is all in the way. How about the woman uh, with the worst of reputations who comes in with the alabaster jar to Simon of the Pharisee's house? Remember that story? All right, she's a woman of the streets. She has violated the laws of God and man. She's held in contempt and disdain by everybody in the house. First of all, Simon. And what did Jesus say? Your sins are forgiven you. And she pours out this precious ointment on his feet and on his hair, wipes or cries over his feet, her tears bathe his feet, she wipes his feet with her hair. What is she doing? She's saying, I don't have much. I have not much. But what I have is yours. Yours. I've messed up. I've blown it. But I'm yours. Friends, that is what God is looking for. He's waiting for humility, for saying, God, I'm yours. And it's so different from, God, you're lucky to have me. <laughs> That's great. Heavenly Father, thank you for the way Jesus is open consistently, every time, to those who will humble themselves. May we be like that. May we bring our alabaster jar 
and our weakness and our brokenness and not try to cover ourselves with our strengths and our successes and our rightness. Lord, we need your grace. And we know that humility, humility attracts it. And so we humble ourselves. God, be merciful to me, the sinner, and save me for Christ's sake.